Graphite has been around for quite a while now. From its ancient origins to its more popular use in early pencils and crucibles, this element has brought in a lot of wonders in our society. But have you ever wondered how one element can produce millions of artworks? The secret does not only lie on its components, but also on how it is acquired and processed. Hello and welcome back to Lord Gizmo. Today we will talk about those processes and get to know how facilities process graphite. But before that, please don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more related videos. It all starts with acquiring the graphite through mining. There are two ways to do this, which are open pit mining where they utilize near surface deposits and underground mining where they employ deeper deposits. In this facility, they acquire the needed graphite through open pit mining. This means that the whole process involves a lot of blasting, excavation and crushing of rocks. The process is quite straightforward. First, they drill holes with uniform depths into the selected area. This machine helps them create cylindrical holes that will later on serve as the cavities where the controlled explosives will be placed. After drilling, they proceed to the strategic placement of explosives. They do this by attaching them on ropes and slowly placing them inside the holes. Once everything is set, they vacate the area and start detonating the explosives. Then, the debris and crushed rocks will be gathered by these excavators. To have a more systematic and organized way of doing things, the rocks will be pre-sorted according to their size. Different excavators and trucks will be assigned to different sizes of the debris and rocks. Then, they will be prepared for transportation. Once they reach the processing facility, the rocks will be fed into a series of machines to grind them into smaller pieces. In the case of large chunks of graphite ore, the rocks are first crushed into smaller pieces through the help of jaw crushers or impact crushers. After that, they will be fed into these grinding mills so they can be crushed into an even smaller size. Since they are working with tough processes, this facility made sure that this whole part is reserved for the grinding alone. If you are wondering how the solid and dry graphite ores turned into this liquid and almost slurry type mixture, this is all thanks to the purification process they do after grinding. This helps them remove impurities like quartz and mica from the crushed graphite ores. Did you know, despite its widespread use and association with lead pencils, Graphite is actually a form of carbon and has nothing to do with lead. The term lead pencil persists from historical confusion with the lead ore. Now, they still have to separate the valuable graphite from the waste rock to process it completely. This is done in two different ways. First, they let it go through wet screening, where they sieve through the slurry to separate the materials based on size and shape. This removes the large unwanted material and creates a size classified feed for the spiral separator. However, this is majorly done by spiral separation. This involves a spiraling trough filled with the slurry from the wet screening process. Thanks to the centrifugal force that it gives and the gravity of the earth, the particles are easily separated based on its density. Heavier particles, with higher specific gravity, sink deeper into the trough, while lighter particles travel closer to the surface. Let us now move to this part of the facility, where the thickening and drying happens. The main purpose of the thickening process is to remove the excess water from the graphite slurry after various processing steps, like grinding, flotation, or classification. There are many ways to do this, but this facility does it through the use of centrifuges. The slurry thickens as it gets rotated at high speeds. This pushes the heavier graphite particles to settle at the bottom and leave clarified water on top. 
To reduce the moisture content of the thickened graphite, they need to dry it. Just like in the thickening process, there are a lot of ways to do this just like the use of rotary dryers. In this method, long rotating drums tumble the graphite particles in a stream of hot air. This allows the rapid drying of the graphite paste. After that, they will be processed even further so that it can result in this huge cylindrical form. Some applications require specific shapes like flakes, spheres, or platelets. The shape of the graphite is totally dependent on what application they will be used for. If the facility is making them for electrodes or battery components, the dried graphite may be further shaped using techniques like compression molding, extrusion, or calendaring to achieve specific shapes and sizes. There are also other facilities that include treatment and surface modification in their process. During this step, the graphite will be treated with chemicals or coating to enhance specific properties like conductivity, lubricity, or dispersibility. On top of that, they can also opt to employ additional purification steps like thermal treatment or chemical leaching to achieve even higher purity levels for specialized applications. Graphite, a naturally occurring form of carbon, exhibits remarkable properties that make it indispensable in various applications. It is renowned for its excellent conductivity of electricity and heat, making it a critical material in the manufacture of electrodes, batteries, and as a lubricant in industries. Graphite is the only non-metallic substance that can conduct electricity, illustrating its unique place in the pantheon of materials. It's also noteworthy for its extreme resistance to heat, with a melting point over 3,500 degrees Celsius in the absence of oxygen, making it essential for high temperature applications. These rolls of graphite will be stored inside these chambers in preparation for bagging. Of course, packaging graphite does not mean they bag these rolls in paper. Graphite is usually bought in powder form. After that, they will be placed inside these sacks until they are filled. Then, these sacks will be stacked on top of each other to prepare them for transportation and market distribution. Graphite can exist in many forms. If it is in the form of powder, they are usually packaged in multiply paper bags with inner liners for moisture protection and dust control. If the facility is making graphite granules, they will often pack them in similar bags as powders with the option of using valve bags for easier filling and discharge. Flaky graphite is packed in plastic drums, paper bags with inner liners, or specialized containers depending on flake size and application. On the other hand, graphite electrodes or other shaped components may be individually wrapped in protective materials before being placed in crates or containers. This journey through the intricate world of graphite processing has revealed the remarkable transformation that occurs from its humble origins in the Earth's crust to its diverse applications shaping our world. We've witnessed the meticulous steps, the innovative technologies, and the dedication of people behind each stage. Who would have thought that the pencils we use are made up of an element that needs to go through many processes before it reaches completion? It is more fascinating to know that graphite is not only seen in pencils, but they are present even in electronics, cars, and gadgets. This versatile element has truly patched traditional items to modern ones. So the next time you use your pencil to draw something, remember what it had to go through before it reached you. In films and books, one of the ways to tell if the character is rich is if they have gold. In today's Lord Gizmo video, we will look at how this symbol of wealth is acquired and processed. We will also take a look at its other uses other than jewellery. The first step has to do with the mining phase, or extracting the gold. It is not found directly on the Earth's surface in large quantities, so most of the mining processes involve taking a deeper look at the Earth's crust. Gold can be extracted using two different main types of extraction. It can either be through surface mining or underground mining. When resources or minerals are found close to the surface, surface mining is employed. Using explosives and heavy gear to remove waste rock and reveal the gold-bearing ore, this approach entails extracting gold from a big open pit. 
When the ore is easily accessible and the gold deposit is near the surface, open pit mining is frequently employed. In comparison to underground mining, this technique can be less expensive and enables for large-scale mining. If appropriate safeguards are not followed, it can also seriously harm the ecosystem. Conversely, underground mining is usually employed in regions with challenging geology or when the gold resource is situated far below the surface. Compared to open pit mining, this technique can be more costly and calls for specialist equipment. Since the gold is removed from the entire vein rather than just the surface layers, it can also lead to higher gold recoveries. When compared to open pit mining, underground mining can also lower the danger of environmental harm. When resources or minerals are found far below the surface, underground mining is employed. Although this form of mining is more costly and risky than surface mining, it is essential for gaining access to some of the most precious minerals and commodities. Gold extraction from deep underground mines is a multi-step process. Getting the mine door to the surface for additional processing is one of the first and most important steps in the process. Large dump trucks or other heavy machinery made especially for maneuvering the treacherous mine environment are usually needed for this activity. These sturdy vehicles transport the ore holding gold from the mine's depths to the processing plant. This facility's location may change based on distance and logistical considerations. It may be positioned near the mine, but in other situations it may be farther away, necessitating careful preparation for transportation. The world's deepest underground gold mine is South Africa's Mponeng Mine, extending over 4 kilometers, about 2.5 miles, below the Earth's surface. This depth surpasses the height of most mountains. At such depths, temperatures can soar up to 60 degrees Celsius or 140 degrees Fahrenheit, creating a sweltering work environment. To combat this, a unique ice slurry is used to cool the air, turning this subterranean world into a paradox of fiery rock faces and icy breezes. The processing facility puts the gold ore through a number of stages in order to extract the precious metal. The ore is fed into specialized machinery in the first stage of crushing, which reduces it into ever tinier pieces. This procedure, which is essential for separating the gold from the nearby rock and minerals, makes use of enormous crushers that can handle hard, huge materials. Grinding, which follows after crushing, further grinds the ore particles into an even finer powder. Large spinning mills loaded with steel rods or balls for grinding are usually used to accomplish this. After that, the fine powder moves on to the next phase of processing, where it undergoes a chemical treatment meant to dissolve and extract the gold from the leftover undesirable elements. It is not enough that the rocks are just placed inside a grinding machine. There is still a lot of process that goes after that to truly extract the gold. Cyanidation is one of the processes this batch of rocks must go through. It is utilizing a mild cyanide solution, usually sodium cyanide, to dissolve the gold. Gold and cyanide combine to generate a soluble complex that makes it possible to separate the metal from the remaining ore. Its affordability and efficiency make it a popular choice. However, some nations have outlawed its use due to environmental concerns, They will then need to experience heat leaching. Using this technique, crushed ore is stacked on a pad that has been specially made and then sprayed with cyanide solution. After dissolving in the mixture and seeping through the heap, the gold is gathered and processed. When the ore's gold content is too low to make more conventional processes like flotation and milling economically viable, this technique is frequently employed.
Refinement is the last stage of the process that the gold particles go through after they are effectively separated from the leftover rock and minerals. The goal of this important step is to further purify the gold by getting rid of any leftover impurities and reaching a higher purity level, which is frequently greater than 99.5%. The two most used processes for refining gold are smelting and fire assay. Fire assay comes first. The precise measurement of the material's gold content is the main goal of this technique. It entails heating the gold-bearing substance to a high temperature in a furnace. In order to expedite the melting process and isolate the gold from undesirable constituents, fluxes and a reducing agent are added. The gold is carefully separated and weighed to ascertain its exact quantity after it has been completely melted. Smelting places more emphasis on physically removing the gold from any residual impurities than fire assay does. This process melts the gold-bearing material by using intense heat, usually above 1064 degrees Celsius in a furnace. Fluxes are essential in this process because they help generate slag, a waste product that contains the impurities. The slag, which is lighter than the molten metal combination, rises to the surface and is gently skimmed off as the mixture heats. The remaining pure molten gold is then poured into molds to harden into the required shapes, such as ingots, which are then ready for trading or further use. The mine's once rough gold is refined into a very valuable commodity through these painstaking steps, making it suitable for a wide range of uses in many sectors and applications. Despite being associated with jewellery and riches, gold is an essential aspect of modern technologies, especially circuitry and electronics. For applications requiring effective current flow, its remarkable conductivity, resistance to corrosion, and ductility make it the perfect choice. Consistent performance and signal integrity are guaranteed by gold's resistance to tarnishing and corrosion, especially in delicate electronic components, because of its ductility and malleability. It can be formed into complex shapes and pulled into thin wires, which makes it ideal for tiny circuits and sensitive electronic components.